and I wish it will be very useful and very fruitful session for the participants. Please, sir. Yeah, okay, so let me share my screen first. Then I'll begin. Yeah. Can you see it? Anything? Not yet. Not yet. Uh, just wait, I guess. Just time. Actually, work from uh, home has actually created a lot of issues because I have to work from my personal laptop now. It is not that great. Let me just. Now is there anything? Mm, not till now. Not till now. Somehow the sharing option. No, it's yeah. the right bottom right. Yeah, of the it, is, it is coming, but that uh, thing is not working actually. Maybe we could have uh, checked okay, it. Okay, you have to first open the presentation, then you have to select it by presentation. Uh, yeah, just wait. You can do it the entire screen. If you wish, you can select your entire screen also. Yeah, maybe I will select the window and share. That is actually working. So is it uh, is it is, it is uh, visible now? No, not yet. You can select the entire uh, your entire screen. That will be easier. Yeah, but it is actually showing that it is sharing. So I'm not sure. And you maybe. need to just disconnect it, then join it again, and yeah, then. Yeah, yeah. Probably. Yeah, that means it's showing that some error in the screen sharing. Or I can do one thing. Uh, if you give me some time, I can join in from another device. I guess okay, okay, no problem. that will, that will uh, work. Definitely, definitely. So, up to what is the time uh, that is allotted? I mean, it's up to 4 mm -hmm. right? Yeah, 4.30, yeah, including okay. the question here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So what I will do is I will probably just try one more time. I'll probably first log off from here and then try to check. Sometimes it happens. There is a some. Sometime it happens a problem. I don't know why it happens. Yes, sir. I... Maybe some of the network issues will be there. Maybe. Maybe some network issues. Dr. Sanjeev? Yes, sir. Uh, so, will we be sharing any uh, feedback to the participants? 
yes in the last session we will share it okay Okay, Dr. Devdi will be taking more five minutes. He will start at the session at you know, 15 15, only six minutes after.
Uh, yeah, so Dr. Sanjeev, I am back. So let me. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, start the screen. Now you can share the screen. Yeah, I am doing that. And yeah, it's now it's going to share now. Yeah, uh, now it's coming. Now it's coming, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I guess it was some problem with the device earlier. So I guess now you will be able to see that. It should be showing starting slide show. Yeah. Yeah, can sure. You, uh, can you see the slides? Yeah, now it's visible. Yeah, okay. So uh, sorry for uh, the delay. I mean, it was some glitch at my end. So maybe I'll try to compensate by some more time if uh, Dr. Sanjeev allows me. So, anyway, this is the uh, title of my talk today An Advanced Analytical and Computational Techniques for uh, MIMO Antennas and uh, Beamform. So, uh, I mean, first of all, I would like to uh, thank Dr. Sanjeev, Professor Evan Sharma, and Dr. Jayavartan for organizing this uh, nice workshop. And I am pretty sure that uh, this is going to be, I mean, this has been starting from the first day. Uh, I attended a number of talks, some of the talks I could not attend due to the other commitments like class and all. But uh, most of the talks which I attended were, in my opinion, were pretty much illuminating, like Professor Sharavi and uh, like uh, CJ Reddy, Jawad Siddiqui and Amalandu Patnaik. And of course, yesterday's talk also, like all of the talks, I guess, I will not uh, singularly uh, point out to anyone, but I guess overall, uh, this has been quite uh, illuminating for most of the students and young professionals, of course. So uh, my, as we see that the theme of uh, this particular uh, workshop uh, was on uh, MIMO antennas and beam form. So, uh, so Dr. Sanjeev, I mean, if you feel uh, like any time my voice is not uh, audible or anything, just feel free to like uh, give me a uh, like message or anything. Okay. So because it is work from home, so sometimes uh, the connection also can get disturbed. So I just wanted to give that disclaimer early on. So anyway, uh, uh, yeah. So this is the uh, let me first uh, start with little bit about uh, the lab that we are uh, setting up here. So uh, it is called IDARE. So it is innovation and development in antennas, uh, radars, and electromagnetics. And details of our lab you can find out from uh, my personal uh, website over there. Uh, the link is given over here. So our aim is to basically uh, resolve the problems on antennas, radars, and uh, general uh, electromagnetics. I mean, that can be both in the classical regime as well as the quantum regime. and uh, which are relevant for uh, the next generation information and com uh, communication technology. I mean, uh, the stuff that we are currently doing that would not have been possible uh, had it not been for uh, this advance in the uh, communication technology. I mean, we uh, otherwise the pandemic, uh, we could not have like been connected to our friends and family. Many of us who are not uh, in physical proximity with them, at least virtually we can be with our Peer. So, you know, I mean, uh, informational communication technology, the research and the development has uh, led to this amazing uh, thing. And the healthcare and uh, security and defense and energy sector. So, work on antennas, radars, and electromagnetics are relevant for all these uh, uh, things, which are particularly important for uh, many of the projects that our country is currently uh, going to undertake. And in terms of the methodology, we are focusing on the components and the algorithm as well as system level research. So by component level, I mean many of us uh, work on antenna design problems. I am mostly talking about the people in the academia that uh, we uh, design certain antennas and we analyze their properties. First, we use certain full wave simulation solvers and uh, stuff like that. I mean, uh, some of us uh, sometimes also use uh, our own uh, codes, particularly in, in house codes. But uh, ultimate aim becomes like design of a particular antenna and we try to test it. We try to fabricate it from a PCB facility and we try to measure it, measure its performance in terms of the impedance matching, in terms of the gain and all those things we do. But apart from that, uh, in my talk, what uh, I will be focusing on that this is a component level that is fine. But when we try to work with the MIMO system, which is a combination of many such antennas, both in the transmitter and the receiver side, then we need to focus on these other two aspects also, like the algorithm and the system level. 
by algorithm level i mean that when you are placing multiple antennas in close proximity to each other they will definitely talk there will be some mutual coupling and uh, that uh, not only the mutual coupling but also interaction between the uh, fields that will uh, actually occur i mean uh, the far zone radiated fields so there will be near field interaction there will be far field interaction and uh, that we have to basically model with uh, some of the algorithms advanced algorithms that we are currently working and uh, as i think one of the talks was there on the computational electromagnetic uh, tools as well uh, tools like fico and cst and hfss the the engineers involved they are tirelessly working on incorporating new computational algorithms that can do some uh, system level uh, analysis and system level uh, research as well so these things we have to be uh, taken care of and uh, in academia we also need to uh, think about these things like people who are working on the antenna research we need to uh, come out of the antenna simulation and fabrication mode i mean that is that will be there for different projects but we also have to think about these aspects so this is one of the key reasons why i chose the title in this way but before i start i will quickly acknowledge uh, some of my collaborators and uh people with whom i am working uh, like uh, closely on different uh, projects starting from you can see indian institute of space science and technology trivandrum and people in the aeronautical development establishment uh, in drdo and aeronautical society of india and then infosys foundation who have uh, endowed me this uh, young investigator grant as well as uh, people from texas instruments and nrsc hyderabad and of course uh, royal military college canada where i did my postdoc and also currently involved in uh, many of the uh, projects uh, and works collaborative works uh, before i also start this is because the workshop is co organized by the ipl young professionals and i am part of the young professional affinity group in bangalore as well as this new initiative because uh, aps uh, chapter uh, is uh, organizing this so i wanted to uh like uh, float this information that uh, the ipl ap society similar to uh, mtt society has for long uh, very actively doing the young professional uh, activities but uh, ap society had the young professional group but recently it has been uh, revamped and uh, many uh, like people uh, have joined you can see the names who have already joined and uh, i mean already nominated and some more members are also coming i mean probably pending in the next uh, few adcom meetings so professor uh, dr cj reddy who gave a lecture a few days back he is currently the chair of the committee and it has some uh, names who we know and uh, uh, like uh, here uh, from this part of the world i am also uh, uh, like taking part here as you can see so with that i will come to the main agenda uh, of uh, today's talk so uh, this is how i have uh, tried to organize it like first i will discuss why mimo antennas are required from uh, for this uh, like modern day wireless communication systems so uh, there must be uh, some reason like uh, uh, why uh, this 5g and 6g now people are talking about this multiple input multiple output uh, technology why it is so important so this is one of the uh, key things that uh, i will highlight first and in the process i will start little bit historically and try to uh, keep a full picture so that uh, a holistic picture is in the mind of the people and then i will talk about mimo antenna design for uh, handset and little bit of insights on some of the research that we did on the four element pattern diversity mimo antenna so i'll mostly i will not go into too much details of all those things just uh, give some uh, like uh, overview and uh, superficially i will try to cover so so that i mean in the interaction session maybe people are uh, free to ask questions and maybe at that time i can uh, interact and uh, explain certain things and uh, massive mail this massive mimo technology so this is very important i guess in the first uh, lecture uh, professor sharavi was mentioning this part that for 4g lt we already had mimo but uh, for 5g we have uh, this uh, like uh, the development has been from single user mimo to multi user mimo and the massive mimo and massive mimo is a key component in the base stations and although the term is mimo we have to understand that uh, there are uh, certain properties associated with this which are not always directly re related to the electromagnetic part of it i mean uh, we know about the array antenna array and we know about the antenna array gain and all those things but there are stuff like diversity gain 
and uh, like many other uh, properties which are closely related to the communication uh, side of the things so it is you can say it is kind of interdisciplinary and the uh, why i am saying this is that the capacity enhancement in the single user mimo and uh, the beam forming and the uh, like uh, uh, like signal to interference ratio interference and noise ratio like sinr suppression in the case of massive mimo they are like not antenna theoretically you will not be able to uh, explain all those things you have to look, little bit look into the communication side of the things as well so this is these are some of certain issues that i will uh, like maybe briefly touch upon but the important part um, the um, and analytical and the computational things are here i mean the last part of the talk that i will discuss that analytical estimation of this correlation what do we mean by correlation how different is it from the conventional port to port mutual coupling that we talk about this i will try to emphasize and then uh, there are ways i mean we do computational research we do research on the experiments and instrumentation but there are certain research problems open ended research problems that require analytical treatment so i will share a little bit of my experience on one of such problems so ap after that uh, in terms of the Uh, computational algorithms like uh, FTTD. How to use this FTTD with uh, conjunction with this uh, uh, concept of CGF that I will talk before, like the cross correlation Green's function, and how to use that to estimate wide band correlation. And this correlation can be far field as well as near field. So there are a lot of things. So uh, I mean, all the things uh, maybe <laughs> if I want to like touch upon in uh, detail. then it will take lot of time but i'll just give an overview of each of these topics and some advanced things that we are intending in terms of the channel modeling and uh, design of this intelligent uh, reflecting surfaces and some research we did on that so this is the overview without further ado i will uh, start the discussion first why antennas are important in wireless communication system so as we know that uh, communication is a uh, process by which the information is exchanged between individuals or computer systems through some common system of symbols signs and behavior this is the i mean textbook definition of communication now the way we uh, classify the communication we say that some part it is wired communication and some part it is wireless communication so wired communication does not always mean that we have uh, that cables or wires like uh, the telephone uh, uh, systems that we probably had back in 90s now also many places it is there but uh, the it has been like almost uh, like revamped or changed over by the wireless system but this uh, fiber optic cables these are also you can say that these are in the guided wave propagation and wired communication you can say although it is metal wire is not involved but it is something that uh, involves the guided flow of electromagnetic waves so uh, different from that is the wireless communication where we have the electromagnetic transfer of information between two or more points that do not use a guiding medium uh, by which uh, to perform the transfer that is the uh, role of the antennas comes into picture when we have this uh, wireless communication systems so what do we mean by antenna i mean in webster's dictionary is something but from itpe definition it is a means for radiating or receiving radio waves and in computer language we call the antenna is the interface or the transitional structure between a free space and a guiding device so these are i mean some of the pictures that we uh, from uh, the uh, like uh, knowledge of uh, basic antenna theory uh, we know that this is the general uh, schematic of a transmitting antenna system so dr sanjeev any issue i probably heard someone asking something so that's why i am asking am i audible yes sir yes, no problem yeah yeah okay 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 thanks yeah. so uh, we have generally a source a uh, transmission line and an antenna i mean that actually does this interfacing so that is what i mentioned here like interface or the transitional structure between this there is you can see that this is the free space wave and in this case we have the transmission line and that where we have the guiding device so 
it may be a transmission line it may be a waveguide like when we talk about pulsar antenna and horn antenna all those things then we have a waveguide there so but this is a two way transmission line so why does the early days of wireless communication since we are talking about uh, the 5g and 6g it is also important to take a step back and just think that how all uh, started so i have just put the famous uh, like apparatus that uh, used by henry hards to do do the like electromagnetic wave uh, propagation first experiment so you can see that it was the spark gap that created i mean we had the induction coil that produced a high voltage and here it is a uh, uh, like spark gap was there i mean uh, uh, sorry there there is a gap is there and here we have the spark being produced and that spark will actually create these electromagnetic waves so these electromagnetic waves when interact with the resonator they produce a small spark in this gap a spark here is actually inducing a spark in this gap so this is i mean one of the first experiments uh, that probably the first experiment that uh, did uh, show that some information exchange can be possible uh, from one point to another using a uh, wireless communication uh, purview so uh, they were do, done in the laboratory using a small uh, this is called a end loaded dipole actually this loading these are the end loadings on the dipole that is given by a induction coil and a spark gap for its transmitter and receiver was a small loop so this was a loop antenna i mean you if you talk about it like that so the frequency generated by the spark transmitter is determined by the resonant mean frequency of the antenna system and uh, these experiments were conducted at the vhf or uhf uh, frequency range and uh, i mean uh, also practical for many indoor experiments so details of this experiment you can find from this link i will not go in uh, elaborate on that uh, but from indian purview we also have to acknowledge and uh, we can feel pride about it that acharya jagadish chandra bose gave the first public demonstration of the electromagnetic waves back in 1895 so almost in the similar time of the hards experiment where he, uh, he i mean did this experiment i you set up you can see over here so uh, details of the setup you can find from the paper that i have uh, mentioned below so he used that to ring a bell remotely and to explode some gunpowder so in 1896 the daily chronicle of england reported that the inventor jc bose has transmitted signals to a distance of nearly a mile and herein lies the first and obvious and exceedingly valuable application of this new theoretical mark so there are a lot of articles on this but later on i triple recognized uh, uh, this part and uh, these experiments why these are so important that he used the waveguides and horn antennas and dielectric lenses polarizers and semiconductors at frequencies of 60 gigahertz so you can see that the frequencies that we are looking now to realize the 6g and all all those communication they were i mean at that time back uh, almost uh, more than 100 years back he realized i mean in the figure you can see that this f that uh, particular uh, structure i mean antenna engineers will quickly realize that this uh, he called it a collecting funnel but it is nothing but a horn antenna that is working at 60 gigahertz so details of this you can find from this paper so uh, uh, we also have to acknowledge the work that uh, done by uh, marconi like who uh, used this elevated aerial and uh, i mean did lot of uh, work on this wireless telegraphy and uh, uh, trans atlantic communication he did and some of the mm, pictures i have provided here but i would like to like bring you bring to your attention the typical marconi antenna that people uh, we are now calling the half a quarter wavelength uh, monopole so uh, it is a typical antenna which has this uh, uh, like radials i mean connected over here so this is the coaxial transmission line this is the quarter wave uh, vertical radiator and these are the ground plane rods so instead of a full ground plane it is using these rods so this type of concept are conceived back in uh, that time so if you look into why i did all those prelude and all if you look into our uh, modern day cell phone handsets and their evolution then you will also find a similarity and uh, and a parallel between all those things so these are uh, the military grade uh, portable am fm radios which had you can see at this uh, terminals i mean uh, the antenna that is protruding out of uh, from this handset but these are not falling in the category of this 1g 2g because this is mostly in the military domain this has not yet come into the civilian domain but uh, the 1g that actually the cell phones that we are use uh, starting the generation nomenclature 
that started from the first portable cellular phone at, at the mix uh, field airport uh, chicago by that was done by this uh, motor dynatac 8000x so uh, you can see that this picture some uh, businessman is talking from this airport to probably some of his peer so this has now come to the civilian domain and we can call it as a 1g uh, communication system and this is the type of uh, cell phone that is used and the antenna so i'll talk about the antenna in a moment but before that how uh, the evolution uh, in terms of uh, what are the parameters that we call that this evolution has happened so one is definitely the voice telephony was always there but slowly what uh, began uh, um, uh, getting pushed into was the data aspect of the things we started we initially we had little bit of this sms and all this kind of texting but later on we could surf the internet and now we are uh, being able to do all this video calling and all those stuff i mean for that matter i mean here also i am using the wireless uh, connectivity in my uh, like uh, it, it is an android tab so i mean that is what we are uh, basically using but uh, uh, what i am trying to say is a voice that uh, probably did not need that much of bandwidth but in the moment we tried looking into putting more and more data streams and uh, video streams in particular then the data hungry uh, nature of these devices started uh, coming into the picture so that is one of the key driving forces that is increasing data rate and all those things key driving forces for this evolution from uh, first generation to fifth generation of uh, system and you can see that for every technology to materialize there is a stage where we have the research and standardization going and there is this commercialization aspect of the thing so it generally i mean right now we are in a stage where uh, certain things are getting commercialized i mean all the details uh, you can probably the workshop attendees have already found in the professor sharabi's talk like where it has been deployed and where and still more and more things are coming and even now people are already started to conceptualize the 6g systems so uh, there is a key uh, hand or trade off between this uh, i mean uh, capacity and coverage so uh, as we know frequencies then uh, we generally work in the small cell kind of environment you can see the 5g millimeter wave cell over here and uh, the sub 6 gigahertz that uh, for the higher frequency it is uh, uh, focusing on the capacity but for the sub 6 it is focusing on both capacity and coverage so coverage aspect uh, is uh, very much important when we uh, look into lower in terms of the frequency so then the cell size also increases so these are the basic some of the trade off that i just wanted to highlight at this point but is uh, capacity the only thing that we are looking into the 5g that answer is uh, no it is partially true but uh, the, the different aspects of the 5g uh, new radio are one is definitely this enhanced mobile broadband we are looking into this extreme capacity of let's say tbps per kilometers extreme data rates and deep awareness these are the aspects i mean for the enhanced mobile broadband that is true but apart from that there are two other arms as well that is one is the mission critical control or what we call the ultra uh, reliable low latency communication urllc sometimes we call and it is basically important for Uh, the strong security and ultra high reliability so in one case uh, we are focusing on the capacity on the other hand we are focusing on the reliability and low latency as well and the third thing this uh, massive internet of things here we are actually looking into high connectivity so uh, ultra high density and deep coverage so uh, i mean why i am saying all this because the requirements for all these things might be slightly different the uh, type of data rate that you would expect for a enhanced mobile broadband application that type of data rate might not be needed or actually it is not needed when we are looking into the internet of things so we should not get uh, mixed up between all those requirements certain things require a certain uh, solution so i mean uh, we have to think it of it uh, as a problem solving way and the similar representation is there i mean uh, this is a 5g hyper service cube this is also taken from some of the company white paper so where we are uh, you can see that the way they are representing on one axis they have the delay part that is associated probably with this one uh, that url lc on one uh, axis that is uh, throughput is there so throughput is actually related to the enhanced mobile broadband and this axis the z axis you can say 
I mean, this is actually the links per kilometer square. So this is uh, linked with the connectivity. So these are the different arms of the 5G system, and that is one key difference between from the uh, previous uh, generations. Because previous generations, we mostly were looking into the throughput and all. I mean, all the aspects were there, but the focus was more on this. But now, uh, apart from that, there are many other aspects that are coming. And 6G, I have not put it here. It is still getting conceptualized, and uh, there are many new things. I will probably at the end of the lecture, I will uh, touch upon those a uh, little bit. So now comes to the main uh, point that why MIMO. I mean, we have introduced. Okay, this was the history, historical perspective. How antennas are actually used for wireless communication, and how we are looking into all those stuff, EMVB, URLLC, and massive IoT, all those things. But why MIMO? Why this multiple input, multiple output technology is such an important enabling thing for these uh, future networks, be it 5G, 6G, or whatever G you may put. So one of the key reason is, uh, I guess my previous speakers and all they have already pointed it out that there is a uh, like if you look into uh, the Ch uh, Shannon's channel capacity theorem and look into the digital modulation techniques, so you will see that in order to boost up the data rate, there are different ways. One way is uh, to boost up the bandwidth itself, uh, but again bandwidth limitations are there. There is a scarcity, so that is one point. You cannot uh, like there are I mean in this slide you can see that I have put some of this data from one of the papers. I mean there are many white papers being released uh, to and fro and the government regulations and all those things are there. But the main uh, point is not changing that we have some limitations in the bandwidth that we get. So uh, we need to operate in a uh, bandwidth constraint. At the same time, if we increase the signal to noise ratio somehow, we will increase the data rate. But again, we cannot uh, operate at very high transmit power levels because of the safety requirements. I mean, you want to communicate, but you cannot uh, uh, like uh, forego or ignore the uh, health effects that might have if we are operating in higher transmit power levels. So the objective is definitely to go towards greener and safer communication. So within this bandwidth constraint and the power constraint, if we are wanting to increase the data rate, there are ways, I mean, uh, we can use higher order modulation techniques, but again, they are, that has some of the associated problems. So one of the technology that, uh, I mean, engineers eventually came up was why not increase the number of antennas in the transmitter and number of antennas in the receiver and judiciously or in a proper way process the data stream that is uh, like either fed into the transmit bit stream or whatever it is received, how to come mine all those uh, signals that is received from all the antenna ports and in the process we can improve that data rate so using multiple antennas in the transmitter and multiple antennas in the receiver actually helped us to uh, improve the data rate i mean the way uh, you have seen in this slide like how it has moved from 3g to lte advanced pro to 5g i mean you can see the numbers i mean from this lte it was probably some mbps but now people are using massive MIMO, they are looking into 20 GBPS. So how is that possible? Uh, you can uh, just uh, operation, whatever I told in terms of the language, I have uh, just tried to uh, demonstrate it through one of the examples of a 16 cross four MIMO system. So you can see that we have the transmit data. There is this uh, encoder, we have the interleaver and the serial to parallel converter and mapper. And then there is this transmit weight multiplexer so here we might need the information that is the channel state information from the receiver so when we have that information we can appropriately uh, arrange the weights and then we are uh, uh, like using this ifft and dsc and up converter and feeding all into this antenna stream now whether we are feeding all the data in separate separate antenna streams or you like like uh, uh, I mean, uh, dividing the data parts into different package streams and feeding into individual antenna or same data we are feeding into all the antennas. Those are, I mean, the part of the communication side of the research. And in the uh, receiver side also, you can see here I have four antennas and there is this down converter and AGC and ADC are there and timing detection. So from here we have ultimately the interleaving and VTIV decoder. So this is just one of the examples. So the reverse process is being followed. So all the signal processing is there. So why I wanted to put this picture is because 
uh, mimo antenna system sometimes we i mean at least myself when i started some work on this domain i had this confusion that what it actually uh, means i mean uh, how how it actually does all these things so the important part is it is not a isolated antenna array kind of thing we have to acknowledge all the work that is going into these parts and the algorithms that are needed both in the transmit and the receive side to make this entire system successful so it is kind of interdisciplinary uh, uh, thing that we are looking into when we are saying that it is a mimo operation now uh, what is what about the antenna engineers why uh, the electromagnetic aspect of the thing is important so or to understand that uh, this is uh, the system from a electromagnetic view point so now i am not showing all those uh like uh, communication blocks that were used and i am focusing on like what are the main design challenges for this uh, 4g lte or 5g mimo antenna based uh, let's say in transmit and the receive end so of course we have the conventional single antenna aspects like impedance bandwidth and gain and the side lobe level front to back lobe ratio polarization criteria uh, uh, i mean whether it's we are using linear polarized or circular polarized and what about the radiation efficiency so conventional single antenna aspects will be there i mean there is no one uh, denying that part but uh, at the same time we have to look into a uh, number of things that are originating from placement of these multiple antennas so one thing is reduction of the footprint it's like we want to reduce uh, the electrical size of the system in terms of the square of the operating wavelength so this is the overall a uh, footprint reduction that we are looking into mutual coupling reduction so uh, when we are saying that okay we'll reduce the footprint so that means that we need to bring the antennas close together i mean then that essentially implies that we have to reduce the mutual coupling between the antennas so you can ask that why uh, this is important like why do we need to uh, reduce the mutual coupling because if we don't do that then whatever algorithms that we are going to put in terms of enhancement of the data rate and all if the antennas themselves are talking to each other then we will not actually get all the diversity and all the nice things that we are anticipating in our uh, let's say uh, receiver decoding part or in our transmit beam forming part so mutual coupling uh, has to be reduced uh, in most of the cases when we are dealing with the single user mimo or point to point mimo and to be particular where we are looking into the data rate aspects but in case of uh, some like massive mimo application uh, mutual coupling might not be that uh, problematic but anyway uh, there are i mean uh, issues but one uh, if we are dealing with let's say we are designing the mimo antennas for access point or let's say a handset then definitely we have to think that okay that these diversity antennas should have very low mutual coupling so to realize that we must have these structures like this uh, neutralization lines or in some cases the ebg or the defected ground structures all those things are there now that mutual coupling that we are uh, focused in the last point it is mostly the port to port mutual coupling but we uh, there are i mean interaction between the antennas that is beyond the port to port analysis because antennas are not simply uh, circuits that we operate on Uh, if we are operating on circuits in the guided wave system then that is fine but uh, we might only have to do with some of the port parameters but if we since we are actually interacting with the free space as you saw that the antennas are the transitional structure from the guided wave to the free space wave so in the free space i mean the wave that is radiated from the antennas uh, uh, that is uh, at a distance from the system not guided or confined within the port or Uh, transmission lines or waveguides so those fields will actually have some kind of interaction and that interaction will uh, is actually quantified by this uh, envelope correlation coefficient and when we are saying that that is interacting with each other i mean one way is that the antennas are operating in strictly free space or a very uh, uniform propagation environment so then a certain kind of uh, modeling is uh, sufficient but when we are working i mean in the present day if we are de designing a, a mimo system relevant for indoor application then we have to take care of whatever the propagation scenario there is i mean uh, there could be uh, a specific uh, direction from where the signal will most probably come so what i am trying to say is there are certain probabilistic or stochastic aspects now being uh, merged with the system analysis 
So envelope correlation coefficient actually takes account of not only the interaction between the deterministic field, but also the effect from the specific propagation scenario. And uh, we now need to tailor the antenna beams in such way and the radiated uh, wave polarization of these antennas in such a way that we can work in the best possible way in that particular uh, propagation scenario. So that actually involves a lot of uh, computational and analytical research. I mean, up to one point, people uh, uh, did away with simplest parameter measurement and calculating the correlation. That is fine, but that is uh, that is not wrong what I am saying. But it is actually being uh, applicable for a very uh, limited uh, scenario. Uh, if we are trying to design the system for uh, is uh, different, like let's say Gaussian environment or Laplacian propagation environment. So then we have to look into the effect of those propagation scenarios on the envelope correlation coefficient. So uh, these are some of the things where I'll uh, discuss later on. But uh, let us now again quickly uh, go back that how the antenna engineering of these things actually worked. So if you see one of the key aspect is the uh, protruding uh, monopole part that is slowly getting lost. I mean, that is probably integrated in the printed system. So this we know, I mean, present day smartphone is something like this, where we don't see the antenna coming out like uh, something like here, like that is back in the 87 or 90s. So how it evolved, one of the thing, I will not go details here, but uh, one of the thing that uh, is there, this antenna is basically a sleeve dipole antenna. So this part, uh, I mean, this antenna is actually zoomed something here. So you can observe that we have a coaxial line and the inner conductor is extended to, from the antenna. And there we have some dielectric insert and there is some metal sleeve over here. Okay, so that essentially helps us to get this uh, perfect omnidirectional radiation pattern because otherwise there will be problem with the unbalanced currents and all. And impedance matching is also helped. Another antenna apart from the sleeve dipole is the whip antenna that is something like this. I mean, just a zoom figure. This also, uh, the objective is to get omnidirectional radiation like this so that the user can actually get signal from all the possible azimuth direction. So this was one of the objective. But later on, as printed circuit technology came, we went with the meandered monopoles and the inverted F antennas. I mean, you can see that how uh, the inverted F antenna that involves a lot of these driven element and parasitic element and shorted pins. The objective is what? Objective is to reduce the antenna size get a proper uh, reasonably omnidirectional radiation pattern and that can be easily integrable with your printed circuit technology. So all these aspects are being taken care of and that is why we are now having these compact antennas in our handsets. Now, uh, in terms of antenna design, that is fine. Like we have come from the sleep dipole to let's say the printed inverted F antenna. But I mentioned a term that is diversity. And in the receiver, when we are saying that we have multiple antennas, we need to have different types of diversity techniques. What does that mean? That means that apart from the original antenna, like let us say this is uh, like taken from this website, antennatheory.com, that we have a dual band inverted F antenna over here, which has a low band arm of the inverted F antenna and high band arm. So it operates in dual frequency mode. So this is a transmit receive antenna, dual band IFA. Apart from that, we have a diversity antenna that can be probably reconfigurable or tunable kind of thing. So it actually helps us in the diversity reception. So we actually tap into the environment and get multiple versions of the signal that is coming from the multipath fades and use those signals to combine. I mean, there are techniques like maximum ratio combining or switch diversity combining. So by those proper recombination of these uh, signals, we can now combat the multipath fading in the environment. Like Multiple fading is not in our hand. That is due to maybe some trees or some building or some other uh, structure that is placed and the signal is getting bounced off all those things and creating all the multipath fade. But at our receiver end, instead of having a single one, if we can have multiple of these uh, devices, multiple of these antennas, and then capture all, the, all of them and do some proper uh, combining, then we can actually boost up our overall uh, data. Uh, so this is the, I mean, in very simple language, I wanted to explain the concept of the diversity. So this type of diversity is in the left side. We are showing that this is a special diversity. The two antennas located 
reasonably far apart. You can see that one end and this is another end of your phone. I mean, this is close to the camera probably. But if we place these antennas close to each other for some requirement, that is also possible. But then we have to ensure that these diversity antennas do not have high mutual coupling. So if we had high mutual coupling, what would have happened? Like uh, you can see, uh, I mean, it is quickly from intuitively, you can see that all the antennas will almost receive similar type of signal. So you will not get uh, uh, the like multipath combination kind of effect that you probably used to have if the for the low mutual coupling thing. So in this type of application, it is important to reduce the mutual coupling below, let's say 15 dB or something. But in nowadays, we are looking into full duplex receivers and uh, stuff where there is also a problem of the self interference uh, cancellation. I mean, that has to be done. So in that we are looking into very high degrees of mutual coupling. But anyway, I'll not go into that part. But if we are placing the antennas close to each other, then how to reduce the mutual coupling? The way is to do the uh, polarization diversity. So you can see that here one has been uh, nomenclatured as H and this is the V. So H is actually the horizontal thing and V is the vertical. So these are the, I mean, uh, like uh, orthogonally polarized receivers that is actually leading to your polarization diversity. So uh, all these antennas, I mean, be it from different handsets, how the antennas are placed, we need to look into the currents on the device because engineering of the radiating current is the way how we can tailor the beam of the uh, like uh, pattern and also it is important to notice that whether the how the antenna is actually interacting with the other part of the electronic circuitry so in the phone there are many things so uh, again I, I i was trying to focus on the uh, electromagnetic uh, interference or uh, the effect of the electromagnetic signal on the adjacent electronics, that part we uh, have to model. So they are also uh, uh, like the isolated antenna, whatever the behavior that we probably predicted, that is not going to actually happen when we integrate the antenna with the system. So these are also some of the things that we have to uh, plan beforehand. Like if the designer or the company, they say, that we have to put the antenna within this much of space because the other spaces are allocated for some other application. So the design of the antenna has also to be modified according to the way. So again, like we have to know the problem before we uh, try to solve it. It should not be the other way around. Like we first design some antenna and then try to fit it in some of the devices that should not be the way it works. And you can see that the different uh, handsets and different uh, uh, devices will have uh, some difference in the pattern. I mean, almost it will radiate in some particular way that is fine. And you can also probably use multiple antennas to cover the complete uh, uh, planes. But uh, it is important that to notice the difference. So that is why I have put two examples over here. Uh, like, and uh, the details of this, you can, I mean, uh, the students, I will probably suggest that to follow this particular paper and the paper that have come maybe after that, because this is also back in 2012. But it is a very good paper on mobile phone antenna design that published in uh, AP uh, magazine. So uh, nowadays, I mean, uh, people are looking into uh, putting more and more antennas because uh, the reason, I mean, it will be clear just from the next slide that if we have more of these diversity receivers, then it is anticipated that we can work within the similar bandwidth and the power level, but we can actually improve the uh, like capacity and uh, data rate, all those aspects we can improve. But the question that comes here is why? Uh, the, the reason for that just uh, crudely, I will try to explain it from the perspective of a single user MIMO and that will also lay the foundation for the some of the uh, works that I'll be showing next on. So the difference between a CISO and MIMO, this is a point to point MIMO system. So you can see that for the single input, single output or CISO, as we call the channel capacity, uh, the units here, it's bits per second per hertz because we have divided it with the bandwidth. It is actually dependent on two things. One is basically this PT divided by sigma and square. That is the SNR signal to noise ratio that we are having and we have the channel response as H. So this is a scalar in this case because we have a single antenna as the transmitter and single antenna as the receiver. This is quite clear from here. 
But when we have multiple antennas, let's say we have empty number of transmitters and MR number of receivers over here, then we can say that the transmit correlation matrix is something like psi t and uh, that receive correlation matrix is something like psi r. So you can say, why, what is this correlation matrix suddenly? So it is nothing but, I mean, here we have empty number of antennas. Let's say empty is four. So the four antennas uh, will actually interact among themselves. I mean, uh, four cross four matrix we will actually get to actually model that, okay, how one is interacting with two, how one is interacting with three and like that. So it will create a correlation matrix over at the transmit end. It will also create a receive correlation matrix. Now, if these two systems are far apart, then this psi t and psi r will be almost independent. Now, what is happening in between? In between what is happening is we generally, I mean, there is a for point to point MIMO systems when the number that is empty and MR are not more than uh, certain specific things. Mostly I've exactly forgotten probably the number that probably is around five to six, like uh, six cross six system up to that probably it will work that we can model the complete uh, channel like this, uh, like this, uh, it is called the Kronecker uh, channel model. So uh, we can actually take a product of these uh, like terms, one term originating from the receipt correlation matrix, one term originating from the transmit correlation matrix, and another term that is the IID uh, Rayleigh wireless channel. So it is basically a matrix that has the dimension, let's say MT cross MR, and each of its entries are actually a random variable and not normal, I mean, it is an independent uh, identically distributed Gaussian random variable. So it is the Rayleigh uh, channel model, sometimes people call it. So when we have this, uh, and this is actually, this is a, uh, I mean, talking about the channel modeling aspects. So the complete channel that has this stochastic part that is HIID that is there, but uh, we also have this psi R and the psi T as well. So if we can ensure that, okay, the, there is very less uh, correlation between the antennas, then our model, we can actually put the uh, stochastic thing. I mean, if you are working on MATLAB, then it, it, you can generate the HIIT matrix and you can quickly calculate whatever the enhancement will be there. But uh, since I'm talking about enhancement, you can actually look into the expression that is there because we have the complete channel as MT cross MR now. So we will actually take the matrix product of this channel matrix and the Hermitian of that. Hermitian means uh, the uh, taking the com I mean complex uh, conjugate of all the elements and then taking the transpose. So it's called the Hermitian and the superscript which we have another H. So I mean, we cannot do away with it. Maybe uh, sometimes it creates confusion that whether taking a power with respect to the channel matrix itself because the channel matrix is also H. But the channel matrix it is in uh, representing bold form matrix vector. And that is the Hermitian operator. So it is not in the board. So that is how we can, you can distinguish. But the point is, when we have this uh, thing, you can actually see that the input SNR level, PT upon sigma square is not changed. It is actually distributed among the various transmitters. And one upon MT term is coming over here. And we are taking a product of this H and H Hermitian. So if you now see the plot, all this C MIMO and C CISO, with respect to this MT and MR, and then you can see that how you can actually go beyond. So it is not essentially breaking the uh, Shannon's limit. It is actually working along with it. And essentially what happens if you uh, actually expand this term uh, under certain conditions, uh, under the condition that uh, you can, you are having uh, independent eigen channels. So uh, that means that you are having very less correlation between your transmit and the receive antennas then this C MIMO can be actually thought of as some uh, um, uh, quantity, let's say K times your uh, C CISU. That is what we are having is we are now operating in a parallel processing type of region. So we are uh, creating parallel uh, sub channels that is essentially boosting up the uh, data rate. So what is that factor? What is that number K and how we can determine it? So let us say we are having a four cross four channel that is four transmitter and four receiver. Then uh, the way it is defined is the rank of this channel matrix actually defines this uh, K. So maybe whatever I am saying, you can actually go in detail and read the communication book, but I am trying to say in very simple language so that it is 
uh, understandable that if you now know the rank of the uh, like uh, channel uh, matrix that is rank calculation you know how to do so you need uh, need to see that okay how many independent rows and columns are there and there are ways i mean uh, to calculate i mean uh, to rank uh, uh, of the matrix i mean that is taught in the basic uh, mathematics courses so once you know the rank of the matrix then you can actually uh, know how much it will increase how much the data rate will get magnified you can see so if let's say we are having a 16 cross 4 so anyway you cannot boost the channel matrix up to more than four times i mean so sometimes it's called that minimum of the number of the transmit and the receive so all those things are there i mean in terms of the channel capacity enhancement so there is a factor by which the uh, data rate is boosted and it is not breaking the shannon's limit as i am saying it is working around it creating by creating the parallel uh, ciso sub channel so this is an important concept that i wanted to highlight so little bit i will discuss that what are the things that generally goes into the design of uh, all these memo uh, antenna configuration and some of the research that i did uh, as a phd student with uh, professor kumar vaibhav swastav uh, in iit kanpur so uh, this is a generic configuration of a planar four element mimo antenna and uh, how like uh, the design specifications were given to us that we need to cover all these frequency bands and we need to also ensure the backward compatibility and in terms of the gain and isolation and the ecc level these are some of the uh, requirements that we had to meet so the objective was to achieve all those things within compact footprint that is uh, compact uh, uh, square of the operating wavelength and operating wavelength by that we mean if it is a wideband uh, system wideband impedance matched system then the minimum uh, frequency that we took that starting from the that minimum frequency you can calculate the lambda and from that lambda you can see how much uh, lambda square is the actual physical area so we took actually different approaches and there are some publications that came out of it but uh, one of the key approach that we took was to use this induced lower frequency modes in the mimo structure and by that i mean later on uh, i actually re explored that part and tried to define it from a fundamental perspective that if you start from simple uh, dipole type of system like let us say i have four uh, printed dipoles like this i mean to uh, the idea is something like to design a four port mimo antenna with this rotational symmetric configuration so if we start let's say from a very simple uh, antenna that is the dipole and from there we try to approach whatever the structure that i did back there so the dipoles will operate at certain frequency in terms of their length when is chosen i mean the values are given in millimeter so uh, you can observe that there is very low port to port mutual coupling between uh, this uh, these two uh, like port 1 and if you compare with the orthogonal ports that is the port 2 and port 4 so the rate curve it is actually uh, quite low um, less than minus uh, 25 dB mostly at that uh, operating frequency and the other two ports I mean 1 and 3 they are because they are having similar polarization so although they are located a little bit far apart you can see in terms of distance the distance is a diagonal it is maximum but still there is a mutual coupling is actually uh, more in that case because of the similarity in the polarization so we saw that how the pattern is there and observe that okay Mm, a significant amount of backlob is also there because although the one of the antennas might be acting as a reflector but anyway some backlob will be created so how we modify the structure now you can see that one of the arm of the dipole we are making it more and more wide so we are making it fat and other arm we are actually making it a inverted l kind of a shape so the overall area that ls cross ls is actually there i mean uh, it is maintained so physical area is not changing but electrically we are reducing the operating frequency so essentially we are leading to the miniaturized performance so that is what we observe that the operating frequency has shifted but not only the operating frequency has shifted we are also significantly changed the mutual coupling uh, characteristics so now the ports 1 and 2 are actually uh, like having pretty high mutual coupling as you can see from the figure and also the port uh, uh, i mean high by that i mean in some part of the bandwidth it is almost uh, touching its minus 10 db after that it is getting reduced and this one anyway it is reduced but 
we can maybe further uh, reduce it. So how to do that? So uh, one of the things that uh, people, I guess, Professor Sharabi's paper was there, so it emphasized upon the use of uh, connected ground plane in these uh, antennas. And mostly uh, these are, I mean, uh, this, uh, what should I say? I mean, uh, the uh, access point or sometimes the handset antennas which need the connected ground plane, but all the antennas might not uh, need. So that uh, that is also true. But anyway, if we connect the ground planes, we had some benefit over here, like uh, from the this structure to this structure, if you go, we have the ground plane connectivity. And that has significantly reduced the coupling between this, these two ports. I mean, it has gone a uh, lot of down, like this port one and port three. This port, uh, it has not uh, decreased much, but we can still maybe operate because it is uh, like touching the minus 10 degree. So any if, if there are any techniques to further reduce it, that will be also good. So that we want, uh, uh, I am not showing it here because it will eventually lead to, like I wanted to explain the structure that I did during my uh, PhD. So the same concept here, I was feeding from uh, the dipoles like this, like the center fed dipoles. Now similar thing we can actually emulate using the printed monopole. So although it is uh, fed by the SMA over here, you can see the symmetry, I mean the way the L shape is there and the uh, like fat ground plane, that thing is mentioned, I mean maintained open. So the way we are having this compacted uh, uh, inverted L antenna arrangement and uh, that we are eventually leading to similar type of S parameter response. And we actually got a merging of two impedance band matched modes. So how that came into the picture that is explained from this figure. Like we started off, let's say a very isolated type of uh, inverted L antenna. So that had a pretty nice impedance match point at this 4.5 gigahertz or 4.4 gigahertz if I'm not wrong. But after that, when we started slowly putting all those ground planes of other monopoles and started connecting between them, then we saw that this has actually retained the original mode that is there, the dark uh, black curve. But additionally, it has created another operating mode at the lower frequency. And similar thing was hinted from the previous structure, but there we started with all the antennas themselves. So from different way, you can approach the same solution. So eventually we uh, got that thing simulated and then we built the prototype and also got the measurements and all the details of the work is reported in this AWPL paper. And there are some extension of that that was reported in another electronics letters paper. So uh, the previous structure was not actually covering certain frequency bands and we thought that there could be ways to uh, further uh, reduce the so-called um, um, uh, like uh, operating frequency of the system. So there we used our uh, another approach that I uh, focused on during my PhD was loading using some uh, split ring resonator or uh, some other like complementary split ring resonator. So resonator loaded and test system that eventually led to further miniaturization of the stuff. So those uh, research were there. But the key point that came up from that research is when we try to analyze the correlation uh, performance of that system in a realistic propagation scenario, we found that it is very difficult to actually uh, get the correlation for a wide band uh, frequency range. At that time, I'm saying nowadays, maybe the CST solver has some of the techniques to get the wide band correlation. But again, essentially the principle is same. What is the principle? You get the radiation pattern at all the discrete frequency. And from the radiation pattern, you do some post-processing. And for during the post-processing, you use some of these angular density functions of the incoming waves, cross-polar discrimination ratio, and check the different incident angles, how the signal is illuminating your uh, receiving antenna structure. So when all these parameters are known, then you can compute the correlation according. So uh, I remember that Professor Sharabi was emphasizing on this point that use of these different propagation scenarios and all. So recently, I mean, uh, I worked with some undergrad students uh, in, uh, in IST Trivandrum and we are also doing some of the antennas for the 28 and 38 gigahertz as well as some uh, sub 6 gigahertz 5G smartphone antenna design. So the idea is, I mean, again, you can see this work like where Pajol has uh, put multiple antennas along the rim of a smartphone structure. And from there, uh, we are actually working on uh, measuring and fabricating this particular prototype. 
so it is a 5g antenna for smartphones for the sub 6 and along with that we can also use the millimeter wave array stuff like that uh, so those are i mean currently undergoing so i will not show the details so what i wanted to highlight is in terms of the handset antenna design how calculation of the uh, correlation and this part is actually important so uh, starting from this access point antenna and these antennas i have not shown fully the results but approach i mean i assume that you understand that it is the similar like we have to check the ecc in different realistic propagation scenarios otherwise there is a way out i mean you can actually do some measurements practical measurements using uh like a channel emulator and uh, like using software defined radio so that is also another aspect where you directly measure the uh, channel capacity of the system but if that facility is not available to you then you have to go through the ecc calculation route and that calculation of ecc is actually uh like uh, what should i say i mean that is uh, something that uh, uh, requires as you can see from this curve i am going little back and forth that it requires calculation of the e theta and e phi for various uh, frequencies and post processing using them so what our thought process was this is there any way out we will see that bypassing the pattern calculation is there any way to engineer the antenna current so that we can calculate the ecc so uh, this was the handset side of things but quickly i'll also go through the base station side of things where evolution of the base station antennas how like uh, uh, you can probably check this particular paper that how the earlier structures typically what were the gains and the height and the aperture efficiencies that people wanted to look into and sectorial coverage was required to cover more number of users and interestingly the because uh, base stations will actually see the signal from the users i mean it will not only transform uni, uh, transmit unidirectionally it will receive the signal from the user so they also needed to do the diversity bit and the diversity in the base station is actually earlier much earlier than uh, when people are using diversity in the handsets so the concept of the diversity was known that it it can combat the relay fading but it was not used in the handsets until we are looking into the p and mimo type of uh, handsets so these are the i mean uh, the way it, it evolved like you can see initially in 1980s it was the omnidirectional kind of antennas long antennas were used but later on people wanted to use this uh, arrays which give the sectorial coverage something like this like uh, three sectors kind of uh, coverage it is giving 120 degree 120 degree kind of thing and a uh, hexagonal uh, cell shape so all these things are there, how to plan the cellular management and all and these are you can see that single polarized elements are used but as i mentioned a good way to combat the diversity i showed the handset example now you can see the original base station example that uh, it had these dual polarized elements dual polarized uh, you can probably use some uh, dipole or other type of like bow tie elements which are dual polarized so one is the main arm and another is the diversity arm and they go to the combiner so you can see that how it is one so from transmit power amplifier it is going to the transmit and uh, duplexing filter it is using but from this part when it is coming it is the one is the main branch another is the uh, like diversity branch and they are going into the combiner so this is the relevance of using dual polarized elements in the base station and also people went into the full dimensional beam so this is also a key difference from the 4g lte base stations to the 5g things that we are looking into i'll quickly uh, go to that part that now we are looking into a full dimensional beam formed antenna system so by full dimensional beam forming what we do if you see that uh, here in this structure we are having the uh, excitation weights and they, these are the beam former structures over here uh, but all the elements are not uh, simultaneously controlled if you are using this power division kind of uh, uh, strategy uh, you are actually using phase shifters at these branches and these branches so it is a layered kind of approach the way you are approaching all of these elements but if let's say we connect a dedicated transceiver directly to each of the antenna element for the maximum amplitude and phase control of the structure so instead of that thing we are now calculating all that testing to all the antenna elements and by antenna elements what we mean this is the structure that is a slot array so you can see 
that uh, this is arranged in a like uh, four, uh, four uh, like uh, eight rows and four columns and each of the uh, element in the matrix that is having one uh, like uh, one polarization slot and a orthogonal polarized slot so total 64 slot elements are there now if we can control all these slots or we have a dedicated transceiver to all these slots then people did some research and saw that this can give you the maximum amplitude and phase control of the apps so that is actually this kind of active phase array or uh, active array this is actually the inception of the massive mimo concept and people thought that that will actually enhance the beam forming capability it will not only give us the azimuth coverage but also it will give us the full uh, dimensional coverage that is azimuth tilting of the beam as well as elevation tilting of the beam that can be done in a very efficient manner however i mean it is not nothing comes for free so we have the we have to look into the economic aspects as well as manufacturability weight and heat management all those things are there so if you want to know more about this massive mimo it is important that we uh, also recognize that the concept was like originally conceived i mean uh, uh, in from india and in fact one of uh, two of my senior colleagues in uh, iscc department you can see their book that is on large mimo system so it was called large mimo system so uh, this book is actually you can see the uh, culmination of the different research work that they did in this domain so how the concept of massive mimo actually evolved and how the large mimo systems can give us some advantages so it is a must to read for most of the student who want to know more about this massive mimo concept so pictorially i am trying to uh, uh, like represent that uh, stuff that i just said that for the 4g uh, base station we are having this kind of uh, sectorial beam forming but now for this 5g base station which will have the massive mimo we are having more uh, directed beams and we are actually can have elevation beam forming as well as the azimuth beam forming will be there so these are the strategy that people are doing and there are test beds and uh, like designs that have people uh, done and what type of antenna elements to be used over there so people in the land university group they mostly worked on simple patch antennas so it does not need too many complication in the antenna we just need to have a pretty basic and working antenna element and if it is multipolarized like the uh, stuff that i am showing here so that is also uh, uh, the, like give us uh, further i mean further leverage and further uh, uh, like usefulness in terms of that so there are like this turning torso architecture where we use this uh, this type of uh, like uh, uh, complete uh, full dimensional coverage is there so what you can see that there are three layers of this patch arrays and individual uh, I, i'll probably not go more into the antenna design here but you can look into the stacked patch antenna configuration and how that gives the dual polarization so in some earlier webinars i might have also discussed on all this, that uh, how these are designed and how the different feed ports are actually leading to a high gain but orthogonally polarized radiation along 16 db or something and people have used instead of the patch antenna stack patch antenna people also use dielectric resonator antennas and other stuff so there are i mean testing uh, for testing of these things uh, how it is done i have just tried to show it like uh, massive mimo base station array and there are some user antennas that are placed over there in an indoor environment so this type of experiments are done to properly model the channel and all but now i will come into the uh, two things one is the advanced uh, like uh, like uh, analytical techniques that are relevant for this both this mimo like normal point to point mimo as well as the massive mimo system so beam forming and all those things that is done in the downlink the why i put this figure from the concern book that you can see the difference between the downlink operation and the uplink operation in the downlink operation you are having the base station over here and we are having the downlink precoding and the base station is communicating to the user but when the user is communicating to the base station that is called the uplink operation and uh, there actually we now have to see that how the correlation matrix of this uh, like antenna array whatever that is there in the base station how that is uh, coming into the picture so before going into that little bit of on the uh, because we are talking about different countries and uh, mostly international uh, projects and books and all those stuff 
but uh, just to give a heads up that there is this 5g test bed project that is almost coming to end and probably now people will move into the 6g and you can actually look into the role of the different institutes here starting from the iic bangalore and uh, iit madras and cwit iit delhi iit kanpur iit hyderabad and samit chennai so there are different focused areas on these things and millimeter wave beam forming and v2x communication which is a very like a hot topic nowadays and also the visible light communication uh, that is a important research area so what are the different milestones and how they achieved you can find in the website and now recently people are extending the massive mimo concept and going into uh, i mean uh, uh, like uh, i should not probably say extending but it is actually uh, like completely changing the purview the way we look into the cellular system now people are calling that cell free mimo system and they are uh, they are uh, calling it a distributed like decentralized or distributed massive mimo uh, channel so this is a very uh, catchy area that people are now coming up and uh, looking for the uh, 6g application cell free mimo system you can probably google and see some of the work but now coming back to what i was saying that when we are operating in the for the uplink then the user is sending the signal to the base station and now to find out the channel analytically there are a techniques which depends on the special correlation matrix of the massive mimo configuration so how to do that special correlation matrix calculation of a massive mimo system so let us say that i have 100 elements over here so now your uh, 100 element uh, uh, like uh, configuration that will have a 100 cross 100 uh, special correlation matrix and the conventionally the way people used to do i mean uh, the, the communication system people they uh, like uh, there is nothing wrong but uh, actually there are a lot of assumptions and many of the assumptions actually are not valid in terms of the real life antenna design for example uh, relative polarizations like the expression that is mostly used in the textbooks or most of the algorithms only depend on the spacing between the different antenna so i'll not uh, detail the maths and bore you with the details but just uh, simply i will uh, say the physical points that the correlation matrix or correlation uh, comb coefficient uh, the expression that is here it is just e to the power j k that is the wave vector and the spacing between the two elements let us say the mth and lth element so the position vectors of the two are actually subtract so that is how we calculate the rm minus rl and we take the dot product with uh, j j k and take it in the exponential argument so along with that we also do the product with some function of theta and phi that is actually uh, in i mean indicating where the user is in which theta phi direction the user is and how the signal is actually illuminating on it but nowhere in this expression you can find is any term that actually connects the antenna pattern as well as the polarization of the element so this is a problem because uh, the structures that i showed for the massive mimo design people are using that dual polarized uh, system and people are using high gain system high gain system that means that that has certain kind of directivity so all those things have to be taken care of and this is what motivated us to extend uh, the special correlation calculation in massive mimo systems so what we did we first focused on how correlation is actually calculated the original formula that i have hinted many times during this talk so in a typical spatial diversity system it is dependent on the uh, like radiated far field components as well as the this term p theta and p phi that is the statistical angular probability distribution and the cross polar discrimination you can see the complete expression over here now uh, the way we wanted to connect this uh, polar i mean uh, uh, correlation coefficient with the antenna fundamental properties is these fields these fields are actually produced by the current if you remember the way we calculate the fields we generally from the current we calculate the vector potential and from the vector potential we do some operation and we get back the fields so essentially we go through a green's function approach uh, that is what we do so why not for correlation also we use a similar green's function approach where we can have the two different current distributions and we can now directly get the, uh, the like the correlation coefficient without going through the field calculation so intermediate we wanted to define uh, some uh, like uh, function that is uh, analogous to the green function conventional 
a green function that is used and basically one of my collaborators uh, dr uh, said miki and uh, of course professor yahya antar uh, they did uh, this work back in uh, 2015 and they worked on some of these algorithms on the cross correlation and can arrays and how to generalize uh, with methodology to obtain the surface current distribution that gives the optimum cross correlation performance so all these work were initially being done but that was not applied to this type of practical antenna system at this point so uh, just to to give the idea i mean in a mathematical form that this is the far field correlation coefficient from the fields that we generally do but far field correlation coefficient from currents Uh, the formula gets reduced to something like this where we now instead of doing the numerical integration on the full uh, 3d uh, space i mean probably some of the mathematical terms that i am saying that needs more explanation so you need to go through the literature but just i'm giving the basic idea that from the currents now we can calculate the greens function tensor and then combining uh, all of their effects we can emulate the far, far field correlation coefficient from the currents and the currents themselves uh, how does that help i mean the advantage of this is if we can represent the complete antenna current in terms of some samples some special samples that contains this infinitesimal dipole arrays then that is uh, uh, like actually very useful and uh, straight forward way we can bypass the uh, like field calculation and we can from the currents we can get the correlation and this actually helps in the back process that is what i am trying to hint it like let us say i know that this much of uh, correlation i need and these are the locations of the antenna so now i can optimally tailor the antenna orientation and then the antenna excitation coefficient all those things i can tailor uh, from the knowledge of the correlation and i can get back the current distribution so this is something that said actually hinted in this paper back in 2015 and we did some work uh, advanced work on that so uh, some of the work then what i did during my post doc at rmc canada i used uh, uh, this uh, cgf technique to estimate the eigen structure of this massive mimo system using the idm that is the infinitesimal dipole modeling and the cgf that is the cross correlation green function technique so this was published in 2019 and uh, later in 2019 another work that we did was this expression that we uh, are talking about the c bar that involves some integration over a uh, full uh, 3d space that means the way we say it that uh, if you remember when we calculate the radiated power from uh, the like uh, radiation uh, density let's say or radiation intensity then what we do we integrated u sin theta d theta d phi we did the full uh, integration something like that so that is what was required and sometimes some functions can be done analytically that is true but certain functions i mean you need to do especially for this system you have to go by the numerical integration so that actually when we go do the numerical integration essentially uh, although we have very fast computers nowadays but uh, it is actually i mean still problematic to do all the numerical uh, integration and it takes time so that actually motivated us that how can we find out some approximate analytical technique that can give us uh directly some close form expression of that uh, correlation greens function in mimo system so this was a work that uh, said originally hinted in his 2015 paper but he never did that completely so there also we did uh, some analytical evaluation so i will show you one by one so one is the eigen space structure estimation of this uh, dual polarized massive mimo system that was in the awpl paper so here we showed that if we consider the isotropic element how the eigen value distribution is and if we consider that they are dual polarized and i mean this interleaved dual polarized array that means i mean this color coding it might be not be uh, that intuitive straight away but what i am saying is this yellow this is representing let's say horizontal polarization and this blue this is representing a vertical polarization so we have a uh, uh, 16 cross 16 uh, array like massive mimo array so uh, and Uh, we are uh, having one uh, horizontal and next to it we have a vertical or on top of it we have a vertical something like that so it is a interleaved dual polarized array so uh, if we take a periodic arrangement of this polarization like this how much it changes if we consider a randomly uh, oriented of this dual polarized array so 
this type of analysis was not possible if we were using the uh, simple algorithm that ignored all the polarization effects so you can see how much the data uh, is actually changed if we do not consider the polarization this is the eigen space distribution that you have but if you consider the polarization it actually changes a lot so this is the impact of the antenna polarization on the channel property so that is what i wanted to point out and this is very important that we understand that by tailoring the antenna property of course there are ways to tailor the channel in different ways i will uh, quickly hint at some of those things also so uh, this interleaved array also we uh, saw that people use the uh, like co located i mean where uh, in the same location we have a horizontal and a vertical polarized array that also we did and we analyzed for uh, different user locations and we studied the effect of the mean azimuth angle on the correlation matrix uh, mean elevation angle on the matrix so i mean details of the work you can follow the papers i will not uh, explain all those things in detail i will uh, uh, just hint at the main concepts so once you calculate the correlation matrix there is a way to expand that correlation matrix like this caruan loop representation is there many other representation are there so what that means is we do the eigen decomposition of the correlation matrix and find out these two things one is a diagonal matrix that contains the non zero eigen values of the correlation matrix and another one is the unitary matrix that contains the eigen vectors of this uh, correlation matrix so using that we can now model the channel what channel i am talking about if you have lost the track i will again remind you that we were calculating the correlation matrix to calculate or to model the uplink channel that is the channel from the user to the base station so once you know the correlation matrix of the base station and then array elements you can analytically compute the channel so this is uh, some of the thing that we did and uh, for uh, like 100 element vertically polarized mimo array for user equipment how it will look like stuff like that now the second paper that i was uh, focusing at was the analytical computation of this uh, cgf tensor itself so you remember the c bar or term that i hinted which was the cgf tensor that enabled us to do all those things so its calculation actually involves an integral like this 0 to pi 0 to 2 pi some fpq which is a function of theta and phi into e to the power jk rd so rd represents the uh, separation Uh, of uh, like between the two elements in the uh, spherical coordinate plane or system so as i said that to evaluate the special correlation that is to evaluate this c bar we need to numerically evaluate this integral so uh, and in the concrete theta phi space which was fine i mean that matlab can do and we got all the results but now we thought that whether can we get any idea that how to do all this uh, uh, computation analytic So in order to do that what we did is we expanded this e to the power jkr d term into a taylor series like this and from there we found out approximate expression for cpq so now the problem reduced that if we consider let's say up to certain number of terms up to a term number n then we can compute all these coefficients ipq and this is a uh, like closed form integral if that is calculated then we can use a approximated expression like the like truncated taylor series uh, representation we can do so without going through all the things we i mean it took me a lot of time but eventually i managed to do that by using beta and gamma functions and some of the advanced maths we uh, i found a way to compute these uh, coefficients and then i also devised an algorithm that uh, uh, how to compromise between the speed and the accuracy for any analytical algorithm you have to look into that okay you have some speed up but how much is the accuracy so all these things we had to study in details and uh, these are uh, like some advantage i mean you can say that okay is probably saying that oh, what, what is the advantage i mean why do we need to go into all the analytical calculated uh, approximation so the reason is if you use the exact formula then uh, for the same system what took uh, almost 300 second 300 second 320 second almost that means more than some 5 minute 5 and 1/2 minute but when we use the proposed algorithm then it led to almost 98% reduction in the time with no loss in accuracy so uh, that uh, shows you that if you can do some close form approximation of a numerical computation part 
then because you don't need to bother your computer with that you already that did the hard work so you will get a speed up factor and a huge speed up factor so this was one of the paper that interestingly i mean it got accepted without any revision i mean all the other papers generally where i work went to multiple revision revision iteration but this one they quickly recognized the importance so this was one of the things now i will quickly discuss the other part that is uh, use of uh, fttt uh, to uh, basically compute the wide band correlation so quickly i mean these things professor uh, dr c j reddy already covered that part which uh, c uh, computational electromagnetic techniques to choose and uh, how uh, fttt is actually relevant when we are doing the highly complex materials but with lower electrical size but if you look into problems with high electrical size and lower uh, degree of material complexity then there are algorithms like this uniform theory of diffraction or physical optics geometrical optics or mlf mm all those things are there and somewhere midway this the moam and all those things are so fdtd is very relevant in analyzing all these handset type of antenna structures and all those things so fdtd comes uh, the basic formulation is nothing but discretization of the maxwell equation so uh this is the way i mean this is known to most of the people who are uh, uh, conversant with the basic electromagnetic theory that uh, now we need the maxwell equation we need the boundary condition constitutive relations so the objective is i mean how to formulate i will not go into the math but just the idea that we discretize this equation we take them uh, in a component comp by component level and uh, from there we discretize it so early days i mean it was proposed the algorithm was proposed back in 1966 and uh, numerical solution of the initial boundary value problem involving maxwell equation in isotropic medium so why uh, they devised this algorithm is the time dependent maxwell equation general form the solution is very difficult so that is why we need go through all discretizations and eventually i mean this is the formulation of 1d fdtt so i'll skip these parts for the uh, sake of time uh so there are different aspects i mean the use of perfect match layers and inclusion of circuit components and after that when we get the time domain data how to get back the s parameters and patterns and all now fdtt solver there are many i mean this xfdtt there and key site em pro also uses that lumerical uh, is one of the tools that nano photonics people mostly use and uh, it is important to note that cst it is uses fit that is the finite integration technique you can call that it is a relative of the fttt for this uh, transient solver so what we did we used the fttt i mean i developed a in house fttt code starting from the basic that can actually solve some simple antenna structures like dipoles and patch and loop and stuff like that so using that uh, in house developed fttt we now a uh, device a couple of algorithms uh that uses the uh, time domain data that is calculated space and current distribution that is calculated by the dtt and does some post processing using the cross correlation means function so these two works actually i did during my phd with professor kv srivastav so where cgf was used with fdtt to do the first computation of wide band ecc so the idea was like this i mean the eventual algorithm that we needed to find out a uh, angle dependent time delay from the location of these different uh, infinitesimal dipoles and then we did the uh, like uh, fourier transform of the combined time domain correlation so these are the issues that we focused and we did a lot of examples because people were not satisfied when we reported those papers people were trying to push us to the limit i mean that uh, how much you can do how much your algorithm can do whether it can solve this whether it can solve that so we showed that it is can be done using uh, two dipoles and uh, multi band systems can also be operated upon we can use the uh, parallel i mean side by side uh, triple band or dual band kind of dipoles and printed antenna so this was uh, one reviewer actually was so uh, that we, whether it's only solvable uh, for this uh, wire antennas so can we solve printed antennas also so we showed that it can be done and uh, then we uh, like uh, like they got satisfied so there are two papers actually but the main paper there is uh, the basic foundation and another thing we expanded uh, the work little bit on a communication in the transaction so these were far field wide band correlation i mean uh, that is by wide band i mean 
that we can calculate the correlation for wide band antennas also so but later on we found that the concept of correlation itself that has some uh, like inherent uh, like limitation because uh, the, uh, the books that we follow uh, and the communication theory that uh, inherently assumes that we are impinging the antennas with plane waves so which are possible when the antennas are interacting in the far field only but nowadays if you look when you have the access point very close to you or when, if you install a massive mimo kind of base station or you can operate in a massive connection of connected iots near a wireless access point that uses mimo then probably you will be uh, what should i say i mean you will be having a lot of i mean uh, near field interaction between these antennas as well so in this paper actually sai then as we uh, introduced this concept of near field correlation which is a new concept that uh, uses the near field electric field correlation near zone electric field correlation and near zone magnetic field correlation and we are pretty sure that later on the solvers will pick up and we evaluated all those near field correlation using our fdtd so interested people can uh, look into the thing so main thing is uh, it can be done for any uh, multi antenna system not only dipoles it can be done for any multi antenna system that is simulated in the fdtd solver and the difference is that whatever uh, s parameter based calculation you do uh, the near field correlation will not be predicted from that because near field near zone electric field correlation and near zone magnetic field correlation they will be completely different because in the antenna near field the plane wave uh, relation between the antenna electric and magnetic field does not hold so these are the things that we focused on and finally before i just in one or two minutes i lend that we use the fdtd code to predict some of the properties like channel modeling itself like it was a large uh, simulation where we had this massive mimo array and number of users placed so it involved lot of computational capacity but there we actually work that how we can use frequency selective surfaces and intelligent reflecting surfaces to basically tailor the beam forming i mean the beam from the different antennas and how to uh, focus the beam into the different users uh, uh, using this frequency selective structure so these are some of the work like uh, this is another technology like i mentioned about the selfie massive mimo but uh, this is also a intelligent uh, reflecting surface based technique that is uh, picked up a lot and you will find lot of papers on this topic like where we have a base station we have a end user but in between we have a intelligent reflecting surface where some waves are falling and some uh, like there is a controller and it can do some of this beam forming using uh, like there are this embedded tunable chips or pin switch and uh, scattering elements so this is a like a very upcoming technology but it involves lot of electromagnetic interaction and the simple uh, like ray tracing based tools or the scattering tools that people generally use they uh, do not have the full electromagnetic property so that is why it is important so this is one of the work in last year you kept we reported that uh, uh, it involves uh, like the electromagnetic simulation of this uh, irs systems in a massive fdtd framework so you can look into all those things and finally before i end uh, all these things uh, beam forming and mimo and correlation near field interaction you cannot uh, uh, ignore the energy distribution along uh, around this uh, like mimo antenna elements like in terms of the bandwidth in terms of the uh, like coupling and all those things so energy around antennas is very important and that is a topic that people have uh, focused on for a long time uh, but well i mean uh, uh, some of the analysis were only concentrated towards the q factors and all those things and but there are more to it and uh, this upcoming magazine paper it is actually uh, available in the ieee explore so you can look into that so it represents the em energy around antennas and how some new concept like this pointing localized energy is actually helpful in uh, this system so with that i will uh, like to uh, end my talk and i would be happy to take any a uh, few uh, questions that are there thank you um, thank you dr devdeep yeah now we will take the questions participants please you can write your questions Here, Dr. Devdeep, I am taking the questions. 
Yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. Yeah, first question is by Dr. Mridul Gupta that uh, few people are raising the concern that 5G testing setups are source of harmful radiations and mm -hmm. causing serious health issues in human beings. Please comment on this. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, this is a question that comes, I mean, in almost every uh, webinar that uh, people discuss about uh, this uh, MIMO and all those things. So as I pointed out, uh, the concerns are, I would not say that uh, the research on the health hazards and uh, that thing has no relevance, but the concerns are actually from uh, not so, uh, like, what should I say, scientific viewpoint. Because uh, when we say that 5G uh, is increasing uh, radiation level, actually we are not uh, interpreting the full picture. The idea of using pointed beams or directed beams, I think Dr. Sharabi also pointed on this point, uh, comment, that the idea is to increase the antenna gain, but not to increase the radiative power. So we have to anticipate that the gain and the power are two different things. Especially that we are directing the signal on one uh, way, and in that process, we are actually going to reduce the power that is being used in the base station. So it is that uh, like uh, the conventionally, if you don't want to do all this beamforming and all, you can simply boost up the transmit power to get the data. And that is that will actually cause the health hazard. But if you are using the MIMO technology and if you are using the proper uh, massive MIMO beamforming type image that I showed, then actually the power requirement in the base station goes down. So it goes towards a green uh, communication system. So it is like that. I mean, if you understand the concept, you will see that there is no worry. But definitely uh, the research on the uh, how much power is there leaking out and how much power is actually interacting, that has to be there. So that is my comment. Yeah, Dr. Yeah, so you can ask the next uh, question. Yeah, Dr. Sanjeev, am I audible? Just I was muted. Okay. Yeah, oh, okay. yeah. 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 How and where we can go for the MIMO antennas? Yeah, can you repeat like uh, where we can go for? Huh. Yeah, how and where we can go for the MIMO antennas? Ah, okay. I guess this is uh, what I was uh, showing in the early times. Like, uh, I mean. It's uh, done in almost like I showed in the handsets and in the uh, base stations and in your access points. So wherever you need to boost up the capacity or you need to improve the signal to interference noise ratio. So there you can use the multiple antenna technology. And it, this is actually MIMO. Uh, you can say that uh, I mean, it is just the name. I mean, people have been using multiple antennas like arrays and uh, smart antenna to do that beamforming and all those things. So it is eventually it is interconnected. So MIMO is just the general terminology for multiple antenna system. So any system we design that needs multiple uh, interacting antennas. So this is the kind of, but uh, as a subset of that, as I told, like in the diversity handset, in your access points and in the massive MIMO base station. And now people are also looking into the near field MIMO. That is another concept has come up. So in the uh, generally uh, in the far field MIMO that we generally operate, the line of sight condition is uh, detrimental. But in the near field MIMO, the line of sight actually helps. So there are a lot of research on that also. So these are like whatever came to my mind. I just uh, told. Yeah. 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 The next question is how we can use facility for testing of MIMO antenna. Yeah, well, this is a good question. Like, uh, so MIMO, and as I hinted that uh, MIMO antenna testing, then you will actually need, uh, uh, what should I call like uh, some of these like complete setup, like where you have, uh, let's say multiple computers and you have this software defined radio and you need to, I mean, these are not uh, too, uh, what should I say, too costly. You can actually buy them and you can make a setup and that from there, you can observe that how the different algorithms are actually implemented in that, that signal processing level, in the modulation level, like QPSK, or what kind of schemes you are going to use. So from there, you can see that, okay, this is the data rate enhancement. And well, communication, people who are doing uh, research on communication and all, they already have most of the institutes, they have this kind of uh, setup with them. 
so from antenna perspective we can use these setups to whatever bimo antenna we design we can make a practical measurement say environment and we can measure the data rates and see the uh, effect so this is what i have yeah okay the next question is sir do you find any advantages of either hfss or cst for simulation on mimo antennas Uh -huh, yeah, I mean, yeah. Probably this is a uh, like also. Uh, so what I will uh, suggest is, I mean, both the things I have used and my friends and people who work with me now, they also use like HFSs and I have personally now I have procured uh, CST over here. So one thing is like uh, the time domain solution, uh, time domain field calculation that can be done using CST and. later on i mean the concept that we proposed the in terms of the near field uh, correlation estimation that might be eventually integrated with all those solvers so uh, in there we will need the time domain fields so uh, that is one of the things like we will uh, in a cst we can prefer in that but hfss probably also have the uh, time domain uh, simulation scope now it is but i am not aware of that actually hfs so i'll suggest if you are interested to do the time domain part then probably uh, cst is the uh, better option in that case okay dr devdeep i think we have taken all the questions okay thank you hey, thanks yeah. for uh, waiting for, uh, i think uh, how much 10 to 15 minutes initially yeah, so yeah, i got you yeah, yeah okay. and yeah then i again thank you on behalf of itpally aps chapter jaipur and the, again from the young professional idpally young professional society uh, affinity group yeah. in a bangalore section and uh, with all the participant i thank you for taking such a vibrant session and uh, covering so many things in a very small session starting yeah. from the uh, you have taken for the memo before after later on you have taken for the emft everything you have covered in a very yeah. short time of time yes and you were inside to the participants uh, to do the research on all these areas yes yes oh, i actually to be honest i means initially i was thinking that i would focus on only one topic and spend most of the time but then i thought that uh, that will probably get if i had gone into all the maths that probably would have gone boring but so i tried to so showcase the different uh, areas which interested student can work and i would like to add that if anyone has any doubt or query on any specific part of this webinar so please Uh, feel free to i mean email me at my uh, e email id that is probably there uh, they prepared the data isc so that i will be happy to entertain so thank you dr sanjeev and thank you professor sharma and jayawardhan so uh, i guess yeah yeah okay participants and dr devdeep let's join at the 5 pm for with the another session of uh, mr karthik from yes. feco yeah thank you okay thank very you. good evening to all of you and we will meet again at 5 o'clock yeah okay thank you thank you participants